Hi there. Um, the next speaker I will introduce. Oh, I gotta put my voice on. Okay. The next speaker I will introduce is named Seema Sadanadan, who is the criminal justice director at ACLU of the nation's capital. She joined the ACLU NCA in 2013 and oversees non litigation advocacy efforts in defending civil rights and liberties in this district. Seema leads the organization efforts in combating discrimination and addressing other issues that have a disproportionate impact on communities of color, such as the enforcement of the district's marijuana laws and the need for decriminalization. Prior to joining the ACLU, Seema was a documentary film maker and campaign strategist for social movements in the United States and abroad. She is a graduate of American University's Washington College of Law and Tulane University. So please help us welcome Seema Sadanadan. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So normally I don't introduce myself with any great detail, but because I'll be speaking for between 25 and 30 minutes, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you a little bit about the perspective that I come from so you can understand um, our journey in DC to combat the war on drugs and mass incarceration. I am a mother of four daughters, I'm a district resident, and I'm an attorney. But my background begins about 15 years ago where I began organizing with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond in New Orleans at uh, a time when New Orleans was experiencing um, a great deal of both heavy-handed policing, um, dealing with open-air drug markets and incarceration, and also um, at the height of gentrification in New Orleans pre-Katrina. After that, I returned um, to New York City and began organizing with my own community post 9-11 um, in Queens, which was experiencing a great deal of, of surveillance and policing. I returned back to India and became a, an agricultural labor union organizer for a Dalit women's movement. And Dalit people are untouchable um, caste and community in India. So you can see that throughout my history, um, it has been informed by these theories about intersectionality. I'm very pleased at the way in which the Black Lives Matter movement has managed to finally lift that conversation about intersectionality into the public discourse and our conversations about the war on drugs and mass incarceration. After law school, I returned back to the United States and attended law school, and um, as um, the person who introduced me mentioned, I began producing documentary films and really became interested in the way in which narratives could en enable us to democratize the law, the law which so often is used to reinforce the status quo, to reinforce the subjugation of people, poor people, indigenous people, black people, people of color. I thought it was very interesting that we could perhaps democratize the law and that it could become a weapon in our movements and our fights for justice. When I came to the ACLU, I originally came as an organizer. And to, the truth is, is that the ACLU didn't mean very much to me despite having done this work for many years. It didn't resonate with the on the ground organizing that I had been doing. And, and this idea of constitutional rights seemed far fetched in the context of this country, of, of the history of slavery and genocide, of Jim Crow, neocolonialism, it was hard to understand how this document could be relevant to a people's movement for justice. What I've learned at my time at the ACLU is that the Bill of Rights, while it doesn't encompass all of the human rights that we should and can be entitled to, it is a weapon for us. It is a weapon for us to establish for the first time in its entirety, the ideas that freedom, equality, and dignity can be the constitutional premises of democracy. I don't think that lawyers are, are oftentimes the leaders of people's movements, but I do believe 
for all of you pre-law students out there that we can be the frontline warriors, both when we defend people and keep them out of, the, of being entangled from the criminal justice system, but also in the ways in which we help to envision a democratic society that reflects the values that we actually believe in. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our journey in DC around marijuana reform. And hopefully through that conversation, I can, I can um, specifically using DC uh, as, as a case study, talk about the impact of the war on drugs and its implications around racial justice. When I came to the ACLU in January, February of 2013, I was asked to identify criminal justice issues that we could use the Bill of Rights to create a meaningful impact in our district community. At first, our focus was the school to prison pipeline. That is the matrix of policies and laws that are driving young black and brown people into the criminal justice system, whether it's in the school context or, or the criminalization of youth outside of school. We needed a common language. We needed a language in which to talk about the law so that people could, for themselves, describe the things that were happening to them in legally relevant ways. So much of being a lawyer is being made to believe that you possess the ability to communicate, to talk about relevant legal issues, and, and that that is unique to lawyers, but that is absolutely untrue. And, and the knowledge is really in the people who experience the greatest impact and, and contact with the criminal justice system. I remembered that back in New Orleans, we used, uh, at that time, a mixtape that was out um, by uh, an artist, Lil Wayne, and he had this song called The Block Is Hot. And we, we would use that song to talk about policing in communities. And so similarly, we began our conversation about rights and about policing by looking at the second verse of Jay-Z's 99 Problems. Now, my 14-year-old tells me that that's old school, but um, it did the trick and I found that people for, of all ages at least remembered the general ideas that were per, put forth in that brilliant second verse, um, which talked about the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment in popular culture and how, how we understand it. And if you all remember that, that second verse is about Jay-Z getting stopped and the officer trying to search his car. He's being profiled as a drug trafficker. We created this common language through this, this narrative and we took it to schools. And so over the first several months I was at the ACLU, I had the opportunity to speak to hundreds and hundreds of people in the district. At, at schools, at high schools, at homeless shelters, in the courtyards of public housing developments, um, in, in recreation centers and libraries and senior citizen centers even, and anywhere that I was invited and could invite myself to, I would talk to people. And several patterns began to emerge as I spoke to young people and people of all ages about policing in the criminal justice system in the District of Columbia. This phenomenon that Jay-Z alluded to of driving while black was very much alive and well in the, in the understandings of people in the district community. Folks talked about being stopped for having air fresheners hanging in their rear view mirror and then being asked to search their car. They talked about being profiled for a whole range of minor mechanical violations like tinted windows, cracked um, windshields, obstruction of a license plate, having not having a seatbelt on, supposedly using one's phone, etc. I learned about something called the jump outs. And by a show of hands, how many of you know about the jump outs? So in DC, jump outs are a strategy. It's a drug interdiction strategy born out of the war on drugs where officers patrol, proactively patrol, primarily black neighborhoods in unmarked police cars. These are traditionally vice unit officers, so officers tasked with enforcing um, our drug laws. They patrol in unmarked cars and use the jumping out of the car, a sort of ambush, militarized, strategy to create an element of surprise so that people will submit to a search. I learned that jump outs were regularly experienced by folks in the district. 
I learned about the use of barring notices in public housing units and how, and how black men primarily were being barred in large numbers in the name of public safety and then being arrested subsequently for supposed trespass in their own communities. I learned that for the young people growing up today, for my children included, the symbols of their education are metal detectors, SROs of being stopped and frisked in the hallways. In fact, my children don't even remember a time when there weren't metal detectors that they had to walk through in their schools. I remember one particular incident where I was called to a neighborhood called Kenilworth Terrace in Washington, D.C., to a recreation center, and I was asked to give a talk on policing and rights to a group of, of young people. When I got to the rec center, there was, there was no one inside except for the organizer. And he said, just hold on one second. And he walked out of the back of the rec center, and he walked out onto the basketball court and the playground. And he yelled out to the kids playing outside. He said, the pizza's here. And the kids came running inside. I looked at the organizer, and I was confused. I mean, these were preteen boys between the ages of about 9 and 11. What could these young people possibly need to hear about stop and frisk? And that's when he let me know that these were actually the young people who had requested this information because of the interactions that they were having. It became obvious at that point that coming of age in the District of Columbia, as in many other cities around the country, for young black children is learning the rules of engagement with a police force that deems them as criminal. It's beginning to internalize a narrative about oneself as being inherently criminal, bad, and I noticed that the young people were starting to use that language even in their jokes and in their play, reenacting the narrative that was being cast upon them. One thing I noticed as I would talk to young people about the school to prison pipeline, I would say, tell me about getting suspended and tell me about how that might lead to the criminal justice system in your life. They would say, no, Seema, that's not what's happening. It's not really getting suspended for us. What it is is that when we, for example, are suspended, police officers approach us and they say that we smell like marijuana. And they say, based on that odor, we, we need to search you. One young man told me he had, he had long locks and he said that he was standing at the bus stop um, on his way home from school one day at Minnesota Avenue and an officer approached him, came up really close to him and said, you know, you smell like marijuana. And he said, I don't smoke marijuana. I don't know what you're talking about. But then the officer proceeded to um, search him. And we know that these interactions have a profound impact on the trust and relationship that folks have with their communities. And he was lucky in the sense that that interaction ended without an arrest, an unlawful detention that went on much longer or, or a shooting of any kind. But we know that many others are not so lucky. Well, my first reaction, both as an attorney and, and as a parent, was that you know, for folks that do smoke marijuana, you just shouldn't perhaps smoke it outside or you shouldn't carry it on you. And the young people repeatedly said, no, we are not, we don't smoke marijuana. Many of them said, not all of them, but many of them said, we don't smoke marijuana. That's not what it is. Um, and so we decided to go back and look at the data. And so the ACLU in the District of Columbia produced a study called Behind the DC Numbers, along with the Washington Lawyers Committee, which produced a study on racial disparities and arrest. And here's what we found. Despite dramatic decreases in the African American population in the District of Columbia, double digit decreases, and DC has historically been Chocolate City. Despite these decreases in the population, the DC jail remained more than 92% black. When we talk about over-policing of the black community so often in our public discourse, it, the conversation turns to black on black crime. But when we looked at the data, that wasn't reflected. There are more than 45 
thousand arrests in the District of Columbia every single year. That's, that's a huge number for a population of only about 600,000. More than 45,000 arrests in the District of Columbia every year, and more than 96% of those arrests are for nonviolent offenses. The over-policing of the black community bears no rational relationship to black on black crime. When we looked at these 96% nonviolent offenses, there were two major categories, 23% being traffic-related offenses, offenses where a person, for example, had a suspended license, uh, an, an interaction in which you wonder, how did the police officer know to stop, search that person, to profile that person, before finding out that they had these kind of technical violations? The other major category was drugs. And with across all drug categories, um, overwhelmingly, about 75% in every drug category was possession. Marijuana being the biggest among all drugs, the biggest category of arrests. It's important to understand that the war on drugs hit DC perhaps harder than any other similarly situated city in the country. At some points in the 1990s, DC had the highest concentration of open air drug markets. And one of the first things I learned when I moved to DC about eight years ago was about Rafael Edmonds, who had become essentially a mythological figure, having democratized the cocaine industry and turned young people into essentially entrepreneurs in a da very dangerous um, industry in the District of Columbia. As the federal government began pouring money through grant funding and bolstering the war on drugs, DC became a major beneficiary. In the 80s and 90s, as our governments funneled resources and equipment into policing and the criminal justice system, they also defunded other institutions which actually spoke to public safety, like mental health services, like drug rehabilitation services. As Michelle Alexander points out, mass incarceration can be traced to the war on drugs. We replaced with mass incarceration the racially coded language of, of the Jim Crow era with race neutral euphemisms. Black became criminal, just as today we see a transition happening where now violence criminal really means blackness. In the 1998 Pulitzer Prize series, Deadly Force, in the Washington Post, the Washington Post found that DC's Metropolitan Police Department shot and killed more people um, per resident than any other large American police force in the country. You may have heard statistics like one out of every three African American men spending time in jail or prison. In the District of Columbia in the past decade, some, some studies have cited that that number is actually three out of four in the District of Columbia. So when you think about the tearing apart of the fabric of a community, in my opinion, it is impossible for the community to meaningfully engage with any economic, educational, housing, or any other opportunities unless we peel back this racist war on drugs. So going back to our study on marijuana and what we found, what we found was that these young people were, were very much correct. Black people made up only about 50% of the population in the District of Columbia, yet they made up 91% of the arrests for marijuana. In fact, all drug categories. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you think, and this is our truth bubble, how many of you think that white people smoke more marijuana than black people? Be honest. Interesting. Most of the people raise their hand. How many of you think black people smoke more marijuana? Okay, one person, two, okay, three people. Okay, so you actually, black and white people use uh, marijuana at about the same equal rates. In fact, our drug markets also run along the same lines as the other markets in our economy, the other socioeconomic lines. So what does that mean? That more often than not, white people sell drugs to other white people, and black people sell drugs to other black people, and college students sell drugs to other college students. 
But when we looked at the District of Columbia, what we found is that D.C. had the highest per capita arrest rate for marijuana, the greatest racial disparity. Black people were eight times more likely, more than 5,393 arrests in the year 2010 alone and climbing every single year. When we took it to public officials, they said, well, we know why that is. It's because black people smoke weed outside and white people smoke weed inside. And we were like, interesting. Let's investigate that. And so we actually plotted the arrests across the entire District of Columbia for an entire year, more than 5,300 arrests. And what we found is that there were no clusters. We, we used freedom of information to get the arrest reports. And we found that not only did odor bear no reasonable relationship to marijuana arrests, but nor did public consumption, that in fact, it wasn't even youth. And, and so much of our public discourse around drugs centers around this, um, like a, a cultural image about young black men congregating on street corners. And you always hear about somebody's grandma. And I don't in any way mean to diminish the safety and value of grandmothers everywhere and elderly people. I just mean to say we need to unpack those mythologies. And I want you to know that despite the fact that the district's black community was hit harder, harder than as hard as any community in the country, support for drug law reform in the District of Columbia when we began this journey was at 37%. Because so often for communities that have experienced disenfranchisement on so many different levels, the impact of drug addiction is conflated with the impact of the war on drugs. 15 arrests a day in the District of Columbia. The district was spending between nine and $43 million to, um, to enforce our district's drug laws. And what we realized quickly was that marijuana was not a gateway to other drugs. Marijuana is a gateway to the criminal justice system. And as the crack epidemic has, has faded, as these open air drug markets of, uh, for crack cocaine have, have diminished dramatically, and then criminologists and sociologists will give you many different reasons for that. Some people say it's because after a generation, folks just really felt that that crack was indeed whack and, and people didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but what we've realized is that is that police forces across the country since 2006 have shifted their focus in the war on drugs away from these other types of drugs and over to marijuana, although that is now changing just in the past couple of years. Let me tell you, as a sidebar, what are gateways to the criminal justice system? A criminal record. A criminal record is a gateway to the criminal justice system. When you have a drug conviction, you cannot receive public benefits. You oftentimes cannot live in public housing with your family, with your partner, with your children, with your grandparents. You cannot access certain benefits as a student. You cannot um, access stable housing oftentimes because you cannot get a job. And this leads to repeated violent and dangerous encounters with our criminal justice system. Now just wrapping up a little bit, I want to tell you what we did with that information. Because I believe, I believe not just as a member of the ACLU, but I believe as, as, a, as a person in, in the movement I believe that we have an obligation to democratize information, to bring it back to the people, and to lift up the voices of impacted communities. And so we took that study and we brought it back to the communities. We took it at every stage. And we went on a campaign with the Drug Policy Alliance with, with many folks in the District of Columbia and folks across the country, with many of the people who emerged as the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement in the District of Columbia. And we brought that study as, as many places as we could and we talked to people. In less than 18 months, we did what many thought would be impossible. 
We decriminalized marijuana in the most far-reaching marijuana decriminalization bill that this country had probably seen until this point. And the very first time, the first time that drug law reform had been moved, and it was primarily moved because of racial justice. You see, in other parts of the country where we've legalized marijuana, the narrative has been safe marijuana. Marijuana is safer than marijuana prohibition, but that just didn't resonate with people. But when we peeled back the data and we were able to show that black people were essentially being select, singled out for selective enforcement of our district drug laws and that it wasn't making our community safer, we saw a dramatic change. And I want to point something out that's important to note. You see, the District of Columbia, when we mapped it out, we found that Rock Creek Park, 16th Street, ran like a line down the District of Columbia. Now, east of 16th Street, where more than 90% of our African-American population lives, were the, almost the entirety of the arrest. And west of 16th Street, which is primarily white, which is primarily um, upwardly mobile, where four major universities are, we saw virtually no arrests. And what do we know about college students? College students <laughs> like to do what? Party, right? So college students like to party. So that was really curious to us. When we dug further into the data, what we found was that west of 16th Street actually had some of the highest marijuana usage rate of anywhere in the country outside of some places in rural Alaska. So when you think about what marijuana legalization can look like, you need only go west of 16th Street to see what that looks like. In less than 18 months, we decriminalized marijuana. We, we moved with a supermajority, and I'll tell you why it was about racial justice, because this bill said that no longer shall marijuana convictions um, create collateral consequences in child support. In any, any way we could reach through the law, we addressed it. No longer will youth be default to be detained for, not, for testing um, positive on a marijuana screen to become eligible for a, a diversionary program. No longer will odor. You know, you can't really dedicate pieces of a legislation to folks. It's not like an album or a book. But if you could, that provision, that provision about reasonable odor, I would dedicate it to those young kids out on Georgia Avenue at the skateboard shop since they're the ones who really put us on. But there is a provision in there which you won't find anywhere in the country that says marijuana odor cannot be used by police as reasonable suspicion to initiate a stop. Now, we're, we moved this legislation and, and what we saw was a dramatic transition. We did what, what many said was impossible. We legalized marijuana in the District of Columbia with more than 70% of the vote. And the African-American community support at that point of legalization was at 63%. And the data has just come out that our efforts dropped marijuana enforcement in the district by a, by a startling 99%. We didn't just stop there. We kept going. We, we worked with the Black Lives Matter movement, and recently we had created enough pressure that the police department has disbanded the vice unit altogether. And so this is a journey, right? I, I want to point something out. My time has run out, so maybe I'll say some other stuff later on in the panel. But I want to say something because it's come to my attention that Something is happening, right? There's no doubt. Young people like yourselves have completely changed the conversation. You know, by, by doing your actions, by being out in the streets, by shutting it down, you have forced the conversation. You have created the political will to move the type of dismantling of the drug war. But we would be very naive to believe that all the power was waiting for was a protest. It's not that simple. I think in some ways the war on drugs is no longer as profitable as it used to be. And so there are other types of community-based supervision that threaten to turn entire communities, and particularly black communities, into prison-like environments. And we need to be very careful. I think we need to be very careful because while we do need to decarcerate, that's a very important point, we must decarcerate. We need to be very mindful that 
the channeling of resources into the criminal justice system has come at the expense of other institutions. And our solutions to that need to redirect resources into education, into employment, into affordable housing. We need to create a space where the criminal justice system, policing, the war on drugs doesn't stand in the way. And I mean, I, I'm sure many of you as I have experienced that one of the things the war on drugs did is um, for people in my family who struggled for decades with drug addiction, it became a barrier both to accountability and to healing. We held a town hall forum a couple weeks ago and a young woman got up and she said, as a child growing up, as a black girl growing up, the police were lighter fluid to the abuse in my home. And that's really stuck with me in thinking about how the criminal justice system and the war on drugs has really um, prevented us from addressing trauma and allowing our communities to heal in the way we, they need to in order to thrive. So I'm so thankful to be a part of this discussion with some of my heroes and mentors, and I really look forward to hearing your questions later on. Thank you.